Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Hege. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk about this important topic, pediatric ACL injuries, long-term outcome, and the role of surgery. Last year, our symposium group, uh, together with an expert panel of surgeons and physical therapists, contributed to this IOC consensus statement on management of pediatric ACL injuries. In this consensus statement, we could agree on the importance of high quality rehabilitation in all patients and the need of injury prevention. Also, we could agree on the need to save the meniscus and that some children need early ACL surgery. I will go more into details about that. And Hege Grinde, Hoave Moxnes, and Holly Silver Grinelli will talk more about rehabilitation, uh, return to sport, and prevention. So I'll give you an introduction to the field of pediatric ACL injuries. I'll discuss uh, the controversies in treatment and the role of ACL surgery. Finally, I'll present the outcomes following our treatment algorithm for these patients. So ACL injuries in children are increasing, a worry due to the risk of re-injuries and long-term knee osteoarthritis. It's a controversial topic and the current literature uh, <coughs> is limited by bias, especially selection bias, and poor methodology. Studies which includes uh, non-operated children and studies on long-term follow-up are lacking. And when we talk about skeletally immature uh, children, it's important to consider remaining growth. So skeletal age is important, not chronological age. So in this talk, when we talk about children, we really mean skeletally immature children. And they are not just tiny adults uh, or miniature athletes. They have open growth plates that are vulnerable to injury, especially during surgery. And they have a slight different uh, anatomical differences and a different uh, uh, pattern of activity. They're active all day and they have many active years ahead of them. So we need to save their meniscus in the short term to relieve symptoms and maintain function. In the long term to protect their knee health. We do not want them to end up as a young patient with an old knee. So should we ACL reconstruct? to stabilize the knee. There are some additional challenges when doing ACL surgery in skeletally immature children. Growth disturbances are rare, but dreaded complications, and they may be underreported. There are also uncertainties regarding the graft maturation in these children. The graft does not seem to increase in diameter as a child grows older, but lengthens. And the pediatric <coughs> knee has small dimensions, which makes it harder for the surgeon. And most importantly, the failure rate is nearly 30% in these children. So different strategies to overcome this problem has evolved. Different physal sparing surgical techniques and increased focus on neuromuscular rehabilitation and controlled return to sport. So, but it is a controversy. Some clinicians advocate early surgery in all patients to protect the menisci, the cartilage, and to facilitate return to pivoting sports. While others, such as us, reserve early ACL surgery for those who need immediate repair such as the bucket handle meniscal tear. For the rest of the patients, we suggest a trial 
of active rehabilitation and the option of having delayed surgery if needed. But the literature cannot conclude on what is actually the best treatment option for these children. So this is, <coughs> this is the treatment algorithm that we use in Oslo. You want to see the patients early to catch patients who may have um, an additional injury that need early surgery, such as a bucket handle, osteochondral defect, or an unstable ramp lesion. <coughs> if they do not have such injuries, we suggest active rehabilitation supervised by a physiotherapist and use of a knee brace, an optional delayed surgery if they have recurrent instability or develop secondary meniscal injuries. This patient, a 14-year-old skier, he's an example of a patient that need early ACL surgery. He has a bucket handle displaced in the middle of the knee in a notch, like you see here. This patient need meniscal reduction and repair, like you see here. And in general, to optimize meniscal healing, we suggest to stabilize uh, and ACL reconstruct the knee at the same time. And there are an abundance of different techniques. I will not go through all of them today, uh, but none have been found to be superior. But we can categorize them in transfisal techniques, where we drill through the physis, or physal sparing te techniques. This is an example of a physal sparing technique uh, used and published by a group in Boston, uh, Min Cocker, uh, and they have published good results. They leave a strip from the iliotibial band at Gerdes to Burkle and turn it around the lateral femoral condyle and attach it there and pull it behind and intraticular articularly and under a groove in the intermeniscal ligament and attach it in the front. This is a different technique, physal sparing technique, <coughs> called the all epiphysal technique, where the drill holes are in the epiphysis, and it's a more anatomical uh, position of the graft, which is believed to, uh, to favor stability. And this is the transfisal technique, where you drill through the tunnels. It's the same um, or similar to what we do in adults, but we do some adjustments <coughs> in skeletally immature children. Uh, for instance, having a post screw, like you see here, rather than a screw interference screw up in the tunnel to avoid the epiphysis. Um, and also in the tibia, uh, we opt for a central position because it protects the physis um, and also a more rounded opening rather than a more oval opening to reduce the zone of injury to the epiphysis. In the femur, we have to be careful where we place the femoral tunnel. With the technique that we use for ACLs today, uh, be where you drill through an anteromedial portal. Uh, the tunnel placement will be marked uh, where you see the B. So that will actually be in the middle of the physis. And if you look at the image or the uh, radiograph to the left, you'll see that this tunnel and the button, because the it's very close to the physis. So you need to make a more vertical tunnel to avoid the physis, like you see in A more similar to the traditional placement of ACLs. Uh, the mark, um, the tunnel with the C, that's the all epiphysal tunnel. So you see it's very close to the epiphysis. So if you drill too high, you will actually drill in the physis. So it's important to use fluoroscopy, X-ray, during the operation. There are different graphs that are used they're all soft tissue grafts. Uh, one group has published um, five-year results 
of living donor hamstring from a parent. Uh, allograft is not advocated in children. Hamstrings is absolutely the most popular graft. This is from a survey done in ESCA. And the hamstring graft, it's a flexible graft, and we know that the hamstring muscle has a stabilizing role in the knee, and the diameter doesn't seem to increase of the graft when the child grows older. Um, and we know from revision studies that the risk of revision is higher with hamstring grafts than patellar tendon. So maybe it doesn't have the best properties for this at-risk population. The quadriceps graft may be a good option, and it's currently being um, investigated. Then, of course, it's a soft tissue quadriceps graft, and probably without the periosteum. And there are some uh, bone um, adaptions that happen in a child who have um, surgery. Like you see here on the image from an 11-year-old, and then the, the image five years later, it seems like the button has emigrated uh, cranially, and the, the, the tunnel has steepened, and also the Blumensatz line appear steeper. And it looks like the, um, the notch is tighter. So we don't really know what these uh, changes mean for the outcome uh, for these children. But we know that a lot of things can go wrong with the epiphysis. You can have growth arrest, or you can have deceleration in growth, or you can have an overgrowth. For instance, if you have growth arrest in the distal lateral femur epiphysis, you'll develop a valgus knee. If you have arrest in the tuberosis tibia, you'll have recurvatum. And if you have arrest in the medial tibial epiphysis, you'll develop a varus knee. So it's important to protect the epiphysis in these patients. So do not cross the epiphysis with hardware, screws or implants, or bone blocks. We have to use soft tissue grafts, and it's probably better to have soft tissue grafts in tunnels than not, have to, not to have anything like, you know, not have an uh, empty tunnel. And we need to save the meniscus. And in children, the meniscus injuries will almost always grow. It, they have a very high potential of healing. So we need to be prepared to suture the meniscus. We need the skill and we need the equipment. So if, if that's not possible, we need to send the patient to someone else. So back to our treatment algorithm. For the patients who do not have early injuries, the additional injuries that need surgery, we suggest active rehabilitation and option of having delayed surgery. So because this treatment algorithm is so controversial, we wanted to assess how are these patients doing over time. So we have followed from 2006 to 2010, we followed skeletally immature children with ACL injuries. And we have recently, it's actually in the current uh, uh, edition of the AJSM, we have published this study, the clinical outcome study. And our primary aim was to evaluate knee function and activity level with performance-based and patient-reported outcome measures. Uh, the second aim was to describe uh, knee surgeries, complications, and secondary knee injuries. So 46 skeletal immature children before age 13 with an uh, intrasubstance ACL injury were included in this study between 2006 and 2010. They all had active rehabilitation initially, uh, supervised by a physiotherapist, and they were followed from the time of injury, <coughs> respectively. Patients with avulsion fractures or, or who needed early surgery were excluded from this study. At final follow-up, 44 patients remained in the study at age 19 years, which corresponded to mean eight years follow-up. At mean eight years follow-up, we did functional testing, 
patient-reported outcome measures, clinical examination, and chart reviews. Validated measurement tools were used. We used isokinetic strength testing in knee flexors um, e and extensors. We used four hop tests, QS and IKDC. At final follow-up, 24 out of 44 patients <laughs> were ACL reconstructed. 16 patients also had, uh, had meniscal surgery. Nine patients had new meniscal injuries since baseline. And our results indicated symmetrical knee uh, strength in extensors and flexors when we compared the extremities, and also symmetrical hop performance. 30 patients had a quadriceps symmetry above 90, which is considered as uh, beneficial in this patient group. Um, on these tests, the symmetry was over 90 for all tests except uh, one hop and flexor strength for the patients that were operated. When we look at the patient reported outcomes, the non-operated patients had high scores on Qs, you see their Qs curve here, and also on the IKDC. A similar curve and also IKDC score is found among the non-ACL reconstructed patients. The majority of patients had a score that was higher than the defined score of patient satisfaction defined by Miller for QS and IKDC. But if we look at the individual patient scores, the individual QS <coughs> curves, we found a variation among patients. So there are some patients who have low scores. The majority of patients were still physically active. The two out of three reduced their activity level to a non-pivoting sport. But that was not only due to their knee function. So 20 out of 44 patients remained non-surgically treated. They were generally active and had good function on the strength testing, hop tests, and reported high scores on the patient reported outcome measures. And there were relatively few re-injuries. But we need to keep in mind that this is not a comparative study. The groups have selection bias due to their treatments. For instance, the non-operated patients are selected copers. And in a court study such as this, we do not have control of the confounding factors, such as activity level. But this is the uh, first study to follow children with ACL injury from skeletal maturity to adulthood, and that provide long-term follow-up of non-operated uh, ACL injured patients. Also, we have a representative selection of ACL injured patients. They were all under 13 years old when they were included and exclusively skeletally mature. Also, we did a second study a radiological study, but I'm not going to go into detail in about this study because it's not published yet. Uh, but in this study, we looked at all the patients who went through our treatment algorithm. Also those who had early surgery, that was four patients. So it's, it's uh, 47 patients in total. And we did bilateral knee MRI and long leg radiographs and short reviews. So we found that the incidence of new meniscal tears in this time period of 9.5 years uh, were 34%. Six of these tears uh, healed. And at final follow-up, we found that 27 patients had normal menisci, and none of the patients had <coughs> developed clear signs of osteoarthritis. So in conclusion, uh, active rehabilitation and optional delayed ACL reconstruction. Um, uh, or, uh, in our material, it was 55% uh, of the patients needed an ACL uh, surgery. But the rest of the patients uh, did well without a surgical intervention. 36% needed meniscal surgery. 91% 
were still sports active, uh, but two out of three reduced their activity level to a non-pivoting sport. Both um, groups had good function and high scores on the patient reported outcome measures. So cobras do exist in the pediatric ACL injured population. Active rehabilitation is an option, but early diagnosis and close follow-up uh, is warranted to catch these patients that need surgery, early surgery or delayed surgery. So remember that the child is not a small um, athlete or an adult. They have open growth plates. Remember, consider skeletal age. Follow the child and the parents closely. All need active rehabilitation and some need ACL surgery. ACL surgery is successful for most of the patients, but the failure rate is nearly 30%. And serious complications do occur. We do not have firm evidence that it reduces the risk of developing osteoarthritis or reduces secondary meniscal injuries. So the surgical indication is finely tuned. It's not one fits all. It's a complicated procedure and it should be performed at specialist center centers. Thank you. Thank you, Guri. And we'll take any questions at the end of this uh, session. So our next speaker is Dr. Hovard Moxnes from Oslo. He is a sports physical therapist with extensive experience in rehabilitation of both young and adult athletes. He is the physical therapist in Norway with the longest experience in rehabilitation of children with ACL injury and he did his PhD on children with ACL injury. And he's also a senior researcher at Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center. So his talk is on rehabilitation in children with ACL injuries. Thank you, Ege, <coughs> um, and to the organizing committee for bringing this symposium together. Um, <coughs> my task today then is to speak about the rehabilitation and more the practical part of what we do with uh, children when they have ACL injuries. Um, first, I'd like to just make that point again that the evidence for the treatment of ACL injuries in children is low. <coughs> Even though this paper is from 2012, uh, there hasn't been much improvement since then. Um, and the conclusions we made in this paper, and I'm putting this up now just so that you will understand the reason why when I talk about rehabilitation, I really can't give you any uh, documentation um, or evidence. Uh, the conclusions, uh, conclusion in our methodology paper was that the scores were low and as you can see, um, that the, the there was a critical lack of prospective studies with valid outcome measurements and documentation of rehabilitation. So most studies are from um, surgical uh, point of view uh, with no um, description of rehabilitation pre or post op or non op. I also like um, to. I was just wondering uh, if you are with a team that don't have the finances out, uh, to have GPS tracking and more advanced <coughs> equipment. Uh, trusting uh, do you have any ideas to how to monitor external control. loads? And the reason or I put this up is that, that in the pediatric uh, ACL literature, uh, there are almost the more systematic reviews than there are uh, original studies. Um, and systematic reviews are only as good as the papers they contain. And I'll give you a few couple of examples and also um, point out that you have to read more than titles uh, for journals these days. So <coughs> we have this study in the, uh, from the American Journal of Sports Medicine 2014 on ACL tears. It's a meta-analysis of non-operative versus operative treatment. And the conclusion is that there are multiple trends that favor early surgical stabilization over non-operative or delayed treatment. That probably means that we should do surgery on all, right? Hello. Okay, um, if you look into the paper, that this conclusion is based on two, if you're telling um, us that fatigue these two is, tables. Is bad and less on this good. side, there are three Why papers. Why would your 
Uh, uh, <coughs> and the outcome here is ratio uh, go uh, from up to pathologic down after laxity, your, your match. which is not very not surprising that those who have having not a had surgery will have more laxity than those and who have and had have surgery. A, uh, the fourth and on the other side, two studies uh, be on the, the patients, the patients who did not return so to sport. Like this so and these not like this. two or three studies is the foundation for this conclusion. Then look, let's look back at our um, methodology, really methodology study with from the highest 2012. Not after the match. There are lots more papers oh, they could have used, no, totally but agree. these three Fantastic. with the red star are the, the three uh, included in the meta-analysis. Uh, this table is uh, uh, put up, so you have the best methodology scores on top and the worst in the bottom. Then. Uh, as Hege mentioned, the, this uh, consensus statement was published in 2018. Uh, and I'd first like to sort of give you the, the points on what's the aim when we are uh, treating uh, pediatric ACL patients. It's to restore a stable, no well-functioning knee that enables a healthy, active lifestyle okay. across the That's lifespan. Uh, it does not say coming back to pivoting sports as quick as possible. It also says that <coughs> we want to reduce the impacts or the risk of meniscal or chondral pathology, degenerative joint changes, and the need for future surgical interventions, as uh, um, Guri just talked about. And number three, to minimize the risk of growth arrest and femur and tibia deformity. The paper also gives us, uh, we were able to uh, have some conclusion and consensus on indications for surgery. So when to do surgical treatment on uh, kids with ACL uh, injuries. Um, and Guri also pointed out that there will always be some that need surgery, but maybe not all. So the indi indication for surgery uh, is that the child has repairable uh, associated injuries that require uh, surgery, like a meniscus bucket, ha bucket handle tear. Or if the child has recurrent symptomatic knee giving way after completing high quality rehabilitation or if the child experiences unacceptable participation restrictions after completing high quality rehabilitation. So the key word here, or the key words, uh, as you can see, is after completing high quality rehabilitation. So we were able in this group to uh, have a consensus that all kids with ACL, ACL injuries should have rehabilitation before we decide whether they sh should have surgery or not. So then I would say that the indications for rehabilitation <coughs> for rehabilitation will be, will be for all the children that does not have repairable associated injuries that require immediate surgery. So that means that almost all of them should have rehabilitation first. I also wanted to put out two papers um, that are good and gives us uh, some more information. They are quite new. So this paper from 2017 where they followed 85 subjects that were quite young, 77% of them had open physis at the time of ACL reconstruction. 91% of, of them returned to some sport. 32% had a second ACL injury within four years. 90% uh, in the same knee, 13 in the other knee. And the re-injury rate for the open physis group was 35%. So we from before, we know that adolescents, uh, those who are, who are a bit older than these, have high numbers of secondary injuries, but it seems like the youngest might have even higher. The reason we really don't know, maybe as um, Guri said, the, the graft uh, gets thinner with age, maybe it gets out of position during growth. But they also showed that a slow return to sport was protective of a second ACL injury. Another interesting study that hasn't had much uh, interest, but it should, uh, from 2014 from the Kaiser Permanente Group in the US. Uh, they followed 71 children prospectively, <coughs> and it's an interesting study because they contacted us in Norway because they wanted to compare <coughs> their own uh, ACL reconstructed children with our non-operated children, because they believed that they did surgery on all. But when they looked into their own numbers, uh, it actually was only 66% who had undergone ACL reconstruction. And this is the bias that uh, Guri talked about. Because when you have a surgical study looking into the records at the hospital, only these patients show up. While these who are the copers, they, uh, they will not come back to the, the hospital, they function well and they disappear out. What they found was that an 
an increased number of significant encounters, meaning uh, instability episodes, was statistically significantly associated with combined meniscal and cartilage injuries. So we really have to make sure that we fo follow them, these kids closely, so that if they have multiple instability episodes, we really should consider surgery. And they also found that there, were, uh, there was an increased time from, uh, the increased time from injury to surgery was not significantly associated with additional injuries. Again, this supports the notion that we don't have to do early surgery unless they have additional injuries. So to my topic, the rehabilitation. <coughs> uh, there is a, a good proportion uh, in this consensus paper on rehabilitation. Uh, we have published this paper in 2012. Um, and I would say that <coughs> one of our main tasks as physiotherapists and doctors with these kids is to help them stay social with, it, with their team or their club. Because if you have an ACL injury and you're told you're not going back there in 12 months, that's not good for a 12-year-old. They have their social life, all their friends there. <coughs> so as a physio, you have to be able to create and design programs that they can do together with their team. Maybe not be part of the full session, but they can be part of parts of the session and do their own rehab on the side. And it's also very important to bring the parents on because they have to do the re rehab with their kids. Because you can't send the kids to gyms three times a week. They can't go to the physio because they have to be in school. So you have to be able to create programs that they can do at home. And in general, we want to optimize their functional stability, which is the main thing. Uh, it's a lot more important with the functional stability and neuromuscular control than muscle strength in the youngest. And we have to focus and target some of the um, more, more important muscles, like the hamstring muscles. We know they are important for knee stability. Okay, we will talk about returning to sports, so I'll go not go much in into that. Um, <coughs> And uh, Holly will speak about prevention, probably also about re-injuries, I guess. Um, so I'll stick to re the rehab. <coughs> so the, we will mainly advocate a functional approach, not a strength approach. Do a lot of neuromuscular training, uh, dynamic stability through hopping and landing after coming through the first phase. And it's very important that you can give them some variation because it's boring to do exercises at home. And I guess none of you can stick their, your hand up and say, I will do 30 minutes home exercises three days a week. That's not easy. So what we try to do is we give them programs uh, and tell them to do them every second day. They can do them every day if they want to. Uh, should be pro progressed by a sports physio. I usually see them once or twice a month. Variation is important. <coughs> Video is a nice tool to have so they can see exercises. And there are several free apps that can be used and they can uh, have uh, for free on their phone. Like this, the Get Set, St Get Set Train Smarter app or the Norwegian Skade Free. The knee section of these includes 18 exercises for prevention of ACL injuries, but they function just as well as rehab injuries. So if you have 18 injuries and you tell them to do three exercises three times a week, then you have programs for many weeks. And then when they finished all their 18 exercises, they go back to the beginning again. So my experience is that you should give them maximum three exercises. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. You also want the parents to be part of this. In the first phase, <coughs> extension is uh, the main thing. Uh, m our experience is also that the kids have more problems with the extension than adults. So doing active exercises, even though it might hurt a bit. And I like this exercise where they're just lying on a bench, relaxing to have the passive extension. The second phase has to include more uh, strength and stability focus. Try to make it maybe not fun, but more fun than going up and down on a step box. This is quite difficult. You should try out by the organizers. Kids like playing with balls, so if you can do the stability training while they're focusing on something else, that's also positive. The hamstring muscles, sorry. Hamstring muscles <coughs> have to be targeted in different ways. And if you want to do, oh, there was sound on this. Strength training, body, 
<laughs> the body weight is more than enough. I also, and I'll talk more about this when we talk about uh, adult injuries tomorrow, uh, when they are returning to sport, try to give them a comeback list. Um, not give them, but they have to make that themselves. Uh, we'll come more into it, but this is a good way to implement parents also. So they have to write down everything they have to be able to master before they can return to sport. And that's easy for me, so instead of uh, guessing that you will be ready in four weeks, I can tell them that you are ready to go back to sport when you have completed all these tasks and that you are confident doing them. The third phase, <coughs> uh, more hopping, landings, eccentric control. And if they're going back to pivoting sports, we for sure have to do some single leg hops and landings. And this is also more difficult than it looks. She's told to try to follow the lines. And some do well. You've seen this picture many times already. So uh, Guri had it in her presentation as well. This is Marcus. Uh, he tore his ACL when he was 11. Uh, he came back to ski racing. He has a brace here on his left knee. Uh, he had surgery at the age of 15. Um, then he was out for a year doing rehab. And now he's in sports school still uh, doing ski racing. Shortly on return to sport, because Hege will say more about this, these are the recommendations from the consensus statement. <coughs> uh, when we have post pubescent that will be adolescents, more than 14 years old, skeletally mature, you probably are aware of all these. The difference when it comes to children is that we have to have a more subjective clinical reasoning. We squeak. We do the single hop test, but we focus more on evaluating the quality of the movements and not so much the length. Uh, this is also partly due to because we did a study on the valid validity of the tests, and we could see that the children are, uh, they have so high uh, variation from test to test that it's difficult to interpret. We also advise at least 12 months before returning to competition after surgery. So hopefully we can have more girls and boys uh, continuing sport, even if they have had their ACL uh, injured. And we also welcome uh, many of you to the Norwegian conference in Lillehammer in November. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Håvard. So my title is Return to Sport and How to Avoid Return to Treatment, and I've divided that into two different questions. So first, we need to know a little bit about what the risk is. So what are the risks of having an ACL injury? And then second, is there anything we can do to reduce that risk? And the risk for children and adolescents, we've already heard, the risks for a second ACL injury is high. So this is Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Kay's meta-analysis. It suggested 13% graft ruptures and then 14% contralateral ACL tears. So, th so this is a serious problem. The children in those studies were between six and 19 years old and the average age was 14. And the question is if we can assume that a six-year-old and a 19-year-old will have the same risk of an injury, or if this is mainly a problem in the adolescent or early uh, adolescent population. So this is uh, another very recent study that looked at reoperation rates in three different groups. So we have 10-year-olds with all epiphyseal reconstructions and hamstring scrafts. We have 14-year-olds with uh, complete or partial transpiseal reconstruction and hamstring scrafts. And then we have 16-year-olds who had transpiseal reconstruction 
and patellar tendon grafts. So that's the adult surgery. But look at the 14-year-olds. So almost half of them had another surgery in three years. And you can see that it's the rates for contralateral ACL surgery and uh, revision that are really high. And then the black category is slightly higher for the 12-year-olds. And that category is other surgery to the same knee. So it includes meniscal surgery without an ACL revision. So the only good news with this study is that the, the reoperations for the 12-year-olds were slightly lower. It's still 30% in three years. So I'm not saying we should be happy. But the um, second ACL surgery rates were lower. Another really important thing to think about is that they, these are reoperations only, and not all the injuries will lead to surgery. So how many injuries would we find if we did MRIs on all of the kids? So Guri already told you, but that was exactly what was done in that study. And this study is very different for several reasons. So all the patients had MRI and x-rays and they were prospectively followed for 10 years. We have MRIs in all and we have a long follow-up, so we expect to see more injuries. But these kids were also younger, they were 7 to 13 years, and they were primarily treated with rehab, and then half of them had an ACL reconstruction during the follow-up. But second ACLs weren't really a big problem in these kids. So we had 7% graft ruptures and no contralateral ACL tears. 34% got new meniscal tears, so that was a bigger problem in this group. And then the really important finding that there was no radiographic OA on the x-rays. If we x-ray an adult 10 years after an ACL injury, we have 50-50 chance of finding osteoarthritis, but that was not the case here. So that's really good news for these children because even though this is a 10-year follow-up, they are only about 21 years old now. And because this is a prospective study, it will take another 10 years to know how they're doing when they're turning 30. Okay, so we definitely want more data on the youngest children, but we do know that second ACLs are a massive problem in the adolescent population. And then, as we move to even older patients, that risk goes down again. So for every one-year increase in age, the risk of having a contralateral uh, ACL surgery goes down by 9%. The risk of an ACL revision goes down by 4%. So what is it about the adolescent population that places them at such high risk of injury? So we know that adolescents are more likely to return to sport. And the question is then if age is just a proxy for early return to high-risk sports. And to look into that, we have used data from the Del Oslo ACL cohort study. This is also not published, so please don't tweet. But in our material, we, s we see the same that everybody else does. From age 13 and up, being one year older means that you have a 6% uh, less chance of a second ACL injury. And we see in uh, those who are 25 years or older that about 30% return to pivoting sports within the first year of ACL reconstruction and about 30% pass return to sport criteria before they return. In those who are between 13 and 24 years, 60% return to pivoting sports in the first year and 30% pass return to sport criteria. So the youngest group place, they place their, their um, uh, IPSI and their contralateral ACL at a much higher risk, but they do not have a, a higher functional readiness for sports. And when we then looked at these three factors together, the relationship between age and second ACL injury was almost gone. Early return to pivoting sport was a bad idea, five times higher risk. Passing return to sport criteria was a good idea, six times lower risk. But as a clinician, this tells me to be less concerned with age and more concerned about the demands of the sport 
and whether the patient has passed return to sport criteria. Okay, so let's go back to the youngest kids, and I just want you to consider that question. We have a 10-year-old with an ACL injury. Should she return to pivoting sport when she is 10? In Guri's study, there was a real risk of meniscal injuries, but there was a low risk of second ACL injuries, and there was no osteoarthritis after 10 years. But that's a small study, and not all of the patients returned to pivoting sports. What we absolutely do know is that the risk is high when they're teenagers. So if she returns when she's 10, should she still be playing when she's 16? And I'll just show you why this might be different. So the left picture there, that's handball for 10-year-olds. Almost half of the players in Norway are children, and we rarely see them getting an ACL injury. The picture on the right, that's handball for 16-year-olds. So we have a lot more speed, we have a lot more of the rapid decelerations and the sharp pivoting movements that we associate with injury risk. So yes, the child changes from 10 to 16, but the demands of the sports are also changing. So we need to have both a short-term and a long-term perspective on sports participation here. And then this is the other side of it. So we know that quitting sports can affect long-term quality of life. It can also affect long-term obesity and physical inactivity. And way back when uh, Hova did his PhD, he found that 44% of the children quit pivoting sports within two years. But, and I think this is important, 91% remained active in safer sports. This is one example from a talented handball player. So she quit her, uh, she, she quit playing handball because of her ACL injury, and I think Hovard was the one who convinced her to become a sprinter instead. So this is her winning the silver in the national championship in the 100 meter. So in most cases, an ACL injury is not something that you fix, and then everything goes back to normal. So you need to work with your patient, you need to know their goals, what are their life priorities, and often we have to offer guidance throughout different stages of their lives. Okay, so I'll move on to the second question. How do we reduce the risk in those who do return to sport? And there are two points on that slide, continued injury prevention and return to sport criteria. So I'll go through the uh, recommendations from the IOC consensus statement on return to sport criteria, and then Holly will take over and talk about injury prevention. So very short on the background, you might know this paper by Mark Paterno from 2010. They prospectively followed 56 young pivoting sport athletes. 13 of them had a second ACL injury, they did 3D motion analysis on all of them and saw that reduced control of the hip and the knee increased the risk of a second ACL injury. Then we have these two papers, both published in May 2016. The one on the left is from our group, the one on the right is from a group at Aspetar in Qatar. Both of these studies were in adolescents and adult pivoting sport athletes. And both papers have the same message. Passing return to sport criteria before you return to pivoting sports is associated with a lower risk of re-injuries. So this is from our paper. And in those who failed the criteria, we had 38% knee re-injuries in two years. And those re-injuries were mainly graft ruptures and medial meniscal injuries in the reconstructed knee. In those who passed the criteria, we only had 6% re-injuries. The group at Aspetar had 10% in those who passed, so we might get this down to 6-10% if we take the time to do a better job with rehab. We also had a strong relationship between quadriceps strength and knee re-injuries. For every 1% increase in the quadriceps index, there was a 3% reduction in the knee re-injury rates. 
Now, we don't know if we have that same relationship in children. What we do know, and uh, Hova talked about this, is that when we do isokinetic testing on very small children, we get very large measurement errors, and some of the kids are also too small to actually fit in the machine. Another thing that we have seen in our data and that is supported by a study from Pittsburgh is that if you use 1RM testing or if you use handheld dynamometry, you overestimate the quadriceps index by 10 compared to isokinetic testing. So these are the criteria that you should check before full return to sports. We have hop tests over 90 with adequate movement strategy, sports-specific training without any pain and effusion, confident and mentally ready for sports, and that can be assessed in the conversation with the, the child and with the parents. We don't have any objective uh, questionnaires that we feel that you could use on very small children. Low risk movement patterns in sports specific tasks. So we don't want stiff landings and we don't want the wide cuts. Those are the criteria for the youngest children. And then for adolescents, we also have a muscle strength over 90. And you increase that to 100 if you use handheld dynamometry or 1RM testing. And if you don't have access to any of that, then you refer the patient to someone who can do that. And then because the risk of re-injury is high after return to pivoting sports and it's highest in the first 12 months, we recommend no competition in pivoting sports before 12 months after ACL reconstruction. And I'll finish with a note on a uh, specific group. So those who sustain their injury when they're very young and they continue with serious pivoting sports into adolescence. So this is a high risk group. And in that group, I have offered a three month follow up throughout adolescence. And the, the point of that follow up is to be able to help with injury prevention and load management, and also to detect any problems that they might have as early as possible. So you might find that there's a small sign of a meniscal tear and you can stop that from becoming a bucket handle tear. Okay, so now I'll leave the floor to Dr. Holly Silvers Grinelli from Los Angeles, USA. <laughs> Holly is a physical therapist and sports injury prevention researcher. She has a PhD in biomechanics and she has extensive both clinical and research experience in this area. So from being one of the people behind the PEP program, right? Almost yes. 20 years ago yes. to the FIFA 11 plus that everyone in soccer knows. So Holly, thank you for coming all the way to Copenhagen. Yeah, thank you. Can I just get the clicker? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation. This is my first time at this meeting, and I've always respected it from afar, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, particularly with this group, it was a real honor to be part of that IOC consensus paper, so I hope um, you all find it meaningful. It's an open access, multiply, uh, multiple publishing publications and multiple journals. So. Um, as uh, Hagen just alluded to, I've been working in ACL prevention for 20 years, and unfortunately, despite our most earnest efforts, <laughs> it's still a massive issue. So we're gonna talk today about um, prevention in the youth athlete and spanning all the way from the young children all the way up to um, late adolescents. So unfortunately, the number of children's ACL injuries in the past few decades continues to climb, and it's a multifactorial reason, uh, particularly in the United States and particularly in geographic areas such as Los Angeles, where we have a really consistent climate. Um, we have increased number of children participating in organized sport, but they're also uh, selecting out to one sport at a very early age. It's not uncommon to see an athlete designate out or select a sport at the age, ripe age of 10. So we see year-round participation in the sports of soccer, baseball, uh, basketball, because there's club plus um, a sort of recreational opportunity for them. And that, in my estimation, creates a pretty myopic athlete. They're not getting this access or this exposure to different types of sports. And from a biomechanical perspective, that creates asymmetry and imbalance. 
we're going to talk about three different registries that were published. This is the Norwegian ACL surgically, Surgical Registry, and these registries have been um, completed over the course, most of them about 10 to 11 years. Um, although the data for children, the, the injury rates are quite low, but they're still so significant in terms of thinking about the sequelae post-operatively post or post-injury uh, for these individuals. As um, the former speakers have alluded to from an articular cartilage perspective, also if there are concomitant injuries to the menisci structures. So what was interesting in this particular group, the ACL rate for the 12 to 13 year old uh, was a 3.5. For the 16 to 19 year old, you see this, um, that was the high risk, oops, excuse me, the high risk group um, with an injury rate of um, 3.5, uh, sorry, for uh, 85 surgeries per 100,000. But this was only reporting for ACL reconstruction. So this data from um, a presentation perspective might be slightly skewed, particularly in this group, because as we've heard before, a lot of these younger individuals are managed non-operatively. Um, this is uh, actually Caroline Finch uh, presented this data um, or published this data, but looking at ACLs in children, and this was the Victoria group in Australia, looking at a range of five to 14 year olds over the course of 10 years. They had a total of 320 cases. Over the lifespan of this um, analysis, there was a 147.8% increase in ACL injury within this group that was measured. So again, despite all of the efforts put forth over multiple authors in the terms um, with respect to injury prevention, we still have this growing epidemic, if you will. This is a USA at registry. This was again conducted between six to 18 year olds over the course of nine years. Um, they measured over 3,300 ACLs over the course of this time. The younger age group is shown here in blue. And again, the incidence is low, but the sequelae are, are critical. Again, articular cartilage, menisci structures, how do these individuals progress when they become 15 to 16 year olds or 17 to 18 year olds? So the overall injury rate of ACL injury um, was quite high, but low for the young age groups. But again, we need to consider the collection of data. This actually measured only reconstruction similar to the Norwegian data. So if we look specifically in the sport of soccer or football um, in the United States, the high school injury rate is exceedingly high. For girls, it's the number one reported injury. Um, and for boys, it's, the num it's number three. We have about 187,000 injuries reported in this age group. So these are the age between 13, 17, perhaps 18. And 43,000 of these are ACL related. So we have a huge issue with respect to ACL injury. Nearly a quarter of all of the injuries reported are ACL related. If we look specifically at the NCAA data, um, this was a study published by Liza Arendt and Randy Dick. This was a five-year period collection. The injury rate for women exceeds that of her male counterpart by about threefold. Um, injury rate 0.31 for women compared to 0.13 in males. And what's unfortunate about this is this, um, this was published by Rob Brophy, and many authors have replicated this work, looking at what happens to these individu individuals longitudinally and after seven years of incurring an ACL injury, 65% of these athletes are no longer participating in the sport of soccer. So perhaps selecting a safer sport, um, such as running or cycling, things that don't demand, um, have the demands of cutting, pivoting, and deceleration. This was, um, again, I know this is about youth population, but I just thought this was sort of staggering. This is a recent, fairly recent picture of our women's national team. And what's interesting about this 45, over 45% 45 of our starting 11 has had at least one ACLR. And that's pretty staggering when you think about it. Um, we worked with the U20s a couple of years ago and over 50% of the player pool population, so that was about 60 athletes, had sustained an ACL injury earlier in their career. So again, thinking about the progression and the sequelae of OA, these radiographic changes that occur over the course of time, Massive issue, so we need to sort of engage from a conversational perspective and really uh, sort of uh, work on our, our negotiation skills with <laughs> getting prevention to be more um, of mainstream in terms of compliance and adherence. 
we think of second ACL injuries, this was published by Mark Paterno, I'm looking at the incidence rate of second ACL injuries um, after, within two years after incurring the first injury, um, six-fold increase compared to uninjured counterparts, and for women it was a five-fold increase. So again, these people are at risk biomechanically, perhaps some cortical control issues here that need to be addressed from a biomechanical and a neural perspective. But here's the good news. Injury, from an injury prevention perspective, there are multiple authors that have published on this, including um, us in Santa Monica with the PEP program and also as co-author of the 11 Plus program. Um, but many programs have been published and have been exceedingly effective at reducing ACL injury, um, even on the low end, um, here at 60% with the sports metric program, but um, upwards of 80 and 89% efficacy in terms of reducing non-contact and contact ACL injuries, which we'll discuss in a minute. So the PEP program was developed, oh, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but over tw <laughs> 20 years ago of this year, um, and it's a dynamic warm-up, and that was designed purposefully in terms of compliance. So it's quick, it supplants the traditional warm-up, it's 15 to 20 minutes to, to conduct, or, or complete rather. Um, it's done with no additional equipment. So again, when we look at um, things that perhaps Im impede compliance or adherence, if you will, um, cost, socioeconomic feasibility, we thought of all of these variables when we designed these types of programs. Uh, this was conducted in 12 to 18 year old female soccer players in Southern California. So we had, uh, th we showed incredible effectiveness for this particular study. It was a two year follow up. In the first year of the study, we had 88% reduction in non contact ACL injuries for a rate ratio of 0.11. In the following year, nearly identical statistics, 35 ACLs reported in the control group uh, compared to four in the intervention group, so a 74% reduction for a rate ratio of 0.26. So we, the following year, we collaborated with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, based in Atlanta with Julie Gilchrist, and we brought this program to the NCAA level to see, okay, if we're this successful in the youth, would it be um, as successful in our collegiate population. So again, that's age group 18 to 22. They're playing division one, so this is a very high level of competition in terms of speed, intensity, and um, just overall velocity. We had 61 teams involved in that particular study, and our results were equally compelling as to what we saw in the youth group. We had a overall reduction of 72% reduction in non-contact ACL injuries. Um, not significant, but we had a 45% reduction in overall NCA ACL rate, um, including contact injury. For those individuals in practice, uh, we had a 100% reduction in um, contact and non-contact ACL injuries. So we had no ACLs occurring in practice. Uh, we know the injury rate is lower in practice or training compared to games, but this was still compelling. Um, and those individuals late in season, so we stratified the data to look at the first half versus the second half of the season. Um, what One of the obstacles in dealing with this population is the season is quite short. And we know as clinicians from a neuromuscular perspective, it takes about six weeks to impart a neurological benefit from a neuromuscular control perspective or from a cortical control perspective um, where we can impart the benefit biomechanically. So when we looked at those last six weeks, we had a 100% reduction of contact and non-contact ACL injuries in the population using the PEP program. And these individuals who were very concerned about, who had sustained an injury earlier on in their career as youths, um, we had a 100% reduction in non-contact reoccurrence. So these programs work, and I'm not just touting PEP or 11 plus or any program in particular, just do something, do a program. <laughs> Um, so we, we, there have been numerous attempts to decrease sports-related injuries specific to ACL. Um, however, there are other injuries that we needed to be concerned with, and so our thought with the, the development of the 11 Plus program um, when we convened in Oslo back in 2005 is there could we develop an effective intervention that's um, r to decrease all soccer-related or all football-related injury. So um, it was an international group. Uh, again, the design was very similar to the PEP study, dynamic warm-up, and just with respect to compliance. Uh, on the field, no equipment necessary, 15 to 20 minutes to complete. And there's, what's nice about the 11 Plus is that there's a progression, and this can happen both at an individual 
basis or as a team, on a team setting. So this from a boredom quotient, if you will, allowed a little bit of variety and variability for the athletes in terms of effort and if there's any variability within athletes and within a team. So uh, part of my PhD dissertation was to look at the efficacy. It was well published in women, um, uh, but there had been no studies to date done in men. This was done in men's NCAA Division I soccer, Division I and II. We had an overall reduction of all injuries captured, including head-related injury and concussion, a 46.2% reduction in injury compared to the control group. We, s we noticed a 32.8% reduction in time loss, so even injuries that occurred tended to be less severe. When we looked at days missed due to injury, for each day missed um, in the intervention group, uh, 1.4 days were missed in the control group, and the intervention group had a higher percentage of no time loss and a lower percent of injuries that were more severe, exceeding over 30 days of time loss. Um, What's interesting, this is fascinating to me, and perhaps maybe one of the more important slides of the whole talk, is that there were significantly fewer days missed within the intervention group, so those athletes utilizing the 11 plus on the day of, of usage. So um, when, the, when the 11 plus was used, the mean injury uh, day lost, uh, time lost due to injury, was 6.56 days compared to 10.65 days when it was not utilized. And the, the, the jury's still out on this, but I really think from a cortical, perhaps, or neural preparation, if you will, this is a really interesting slide, because I think um, pretty fascinating with respect to what are these programs doing in terms of neural prep um, on the specific day, and what is the recidivism rate of that? Um, so if you will, if it's utilized on one day, does it have an effect for two hours, three hours, four hours, and over um, detailed compliance and high compliance, will the recidivism rate go lower? And we're, we're looking at this now in a new study that we're conducting. Um, a new paper that was published is the 11 plus for kids, including the PEP program. We have adaptations for youth, so those athletes under the age of 12 um, makes it more amenable to their biomechanics and their specific physiologic needs. But the mean age of this particular study was 10, 10.8. Um, they saw a 48% overall reduction in injury. Uh, severe injuries were decreased by 74%, and all lower extremity injuries were decreased by 55%. And not unlike what we saw with the 11 plus in the older age athletes, the 11 plus for kids demonstrated that with increased compliance and program adherence, injury rates decrease. So one of the, the questions was, does the 11 plus, is it effective specific to ACL injury? So we published this a paper recently in KISTA, uh, co co sorry, core clinical orthopedics, um, looking at the analysis of injury rate within that particular cohort. And we did, we saw a 76% decrease in ACL injury rate by using the 11 plus. Now remember the 11 plus, the original um, essence, the, the impetus for that particular program was to sort of target all injuries, which we thought initially was a pretty lofty goal, and would it be as effective as targeted ACL prevention programs? And we're finding, yes, indeed it is. Um, we did not see a significant reduction in contact injury, however. So a variable that we've already touched on is the variable of compliance, and that become, that's a bit of my Achilles heel, because I always think, as a clinician, we've been working for 20 plus years trying to develop these programs. They work, they're scientifically vetted, we know they work. Why do people not use them? <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a hard uh, question to tackle. Um, so we know that compliance and injury prevention are inversely correlated. That's been well established in the literature. Um, high adherence to programs, um, injury prevention programs that have been shown to be effective have demonstrated a lower injury rates in Canadian youth football soccer. In contrast, when compliance and adherence is low or it's diminished, injury rates rise. So we looked at the average use of the 11 plus within the population that we were discussing earlier, and we found exactly what you would think we found, that um, well, we had use of the program was higher in the first half of the season, so we had higher adherence to the program in the first half of the season. Um, schools with extended seasons, meaning those were that were more successful if they went on to look sort of playoff and champions play, uh, tended to utilize the program, which is an interesting thought we'll get to in just a second. But does compliance impact injury rate? 
so the high compliance groups, so those individuals, teams, utilizing the program more than two times per week, demonstrated statistically fewer injuries than the low and the moderate utilizations, um, which, again, makes sense, but it's nice to see it sort of be vetted within the, the statistics. And we see this inverse correlation, so we see injury rate declining as compliance increases. And this was um, incidentally reported by Soligard as well in the female population. So compliance and time loss due to injury, does compliance impact time loss? So we know it impacts injury rate, does it impact time loss? And yes, indeed it does. We saw in the high compliance group that the injury rate was um, 7.59 days compared to 11.89 and 9.6 days in the moderate and low compliance groups respectively. So we're seeing not only fewer injuries, we're seeing less severe injuries in the high compliance group. Um, and then the big question, and I think this becomes our selling point, if you will, to coaches and players, because if the, if the appeal of injury prevention and, or, um, is not sexy enough, I'd say, well, if we help your performance, your team performance, if your outcomes are better, would that be a compelling reason for you to utilize the programs? And what we found, this is not published, this is in peer review, so perhaps not uh, tweet this out quite yet, but what we found was that team win-loss record compared to the 11 plus utilization, and we found a statistical relationship between those programs that utilized the 11 plus had statistically more wins, fewer losses, there was no statistical difference in ties. And in fact, one of our teams in the 11 plus program um, had won the national championship in our division two program. And I'm not touting that we're creating better athletes, but I am touting that are better soccer players. But perhaps, one, the roster is more robust. You have more athletes available to choose from a coaching perspective, and they're more biomechanically sound. So does compliance impact performance? Again, we see, saw the statistical difference in high compliance, very big difference in the win ca category compared to losses and ties compared to the rest of the groups. So the summary of findings, we know that compliance is inversely correlated to injury rate. We know that high compliance is correlated to decreased time loss, so the injuries tend to be less severe. We also know that the 11 plus teams or injury prevention programs in general tend to perform more favorably. Again, they're more available and they're more biomechanically sound. Um, so that, that helps performance, team performance in terms of win-loss record. So in terms of our conversations to coaches and players and parents in terms of compliance to these programs, perhaps this is really an integral part of the conversation in terms of imparting higher levels of adherence and um, program fidelity. So from a future direction perspective, I think um, there's been a lot of controversy in the literature about can we identify our high-risk individuals? And I'm not sure that we can, but I think we need to still struggle or still uh, still study the fact that if you know if we can refine those in terms of um being more the, uh, analyzing the specificity if you will and looking at deleterious pathokinematics and to see if we can identify these high-risk individuals in the first place um, can we be predictive jury's still out uh, determine if our screening tools currently, and we just heard this beautiful talk on the return to sport criteria, but do we have the intended specificity to identify risk or identify pathokinematics in general? And are our injury prevention programs good enough? Can we continue to refine them? Um, the compliance and program adoption and program fidelity continue to beleaguer us. It's a struggle, and I think we're going to have a nice talk about this in, later on in the conference, um, about the, ad, the addressing this particular issue, increasing compliance and increasing program fidelity throughout um, the course of the season. And we want to refine the existing IPPs, so these prevention programs, again, they've been developed for the better course of the last three decades, um, to reflect our new knowledge and improve our functional outcomes. And obviously, we want to intervene early to protect the youth. You know, with, when we think of the sequelae of events with respect to the osteoarthritis, radiographic changes, and perhaps concomitant injuries to the menisci structures, it, we are implored as clinicians to prevent the injury in the first place if we can. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Holly. Mm -hmm. um, Holly, can you just stay up with your mic? Sure. And mm -hmm. Yuri and Hovat, can you two come mm -hmm. up? and we can open up for questions. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you. <laughs> Good on time, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Hello, uh, Gret Miklebus from Oslo Sport Trauma Research Center. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a great uh, symposium. And uh, I want to ask you, Holly, uh, we know that prevention works. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some good advice how we can convince uh, the players and coaches to follow the programs? It's really difficult. <laughs> I think I do think the performance component will help the conversation because, um, quite frankly, even dealing with our professional teams within Major League Soccer, uh, we, we were doing a study specific to hamstring injury. And although we get a 96% response rate that hamstring injury is a big problem, um, only uh, two teams were interested in an intervention. So it's like where we bridge that gap, that whole gray area between understanding the science and intellectualizing it and then putting it into practice. But I do think from a performance perspective, when we kind of flip it, like this is going to directly help you from an outcome perspective in terms of wins. Um, and if we can make the conversation perhaps more specific, like as we stand here as clinicians and scientists, that's important to us, you know, the radiographic changes. And that perhaps may be lost on that audience. So I think we need to really think about putting ourselves in the shoes of the coaches, players, and parents and flipping the conversation from a performance perspective. And I'd like to add a bit, because I think <coughs> so in the, in the organizing of this, we mm -hmm. really should focus more on um, getting the message out to the clubs, um, mm -hmm. not only to teams and individuals, but if we can sort of have the clubs integrate this into their culture so that they start when they are 10 years old with every team, regardless if it's a parent or if it's a professional coach, so that the youngest sort of get sure. accustomed mm -hmm. to the, this is something that we do from Just the beginning. Normal. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I know in Norway we have something called the Quality Club, which is uh, something you can have from the football association. So and the, the club they can have a flag outside where it says we are a quality club, um, and we are working hard now to get this in as part of that being a quality club that they can um, <coughs> document that they are actually doing uh, preventive measures from early on. Agreed. I'm um, Holly Pailo. I'm a pediatric orthopedic from Finland. And I would like to ask, uh, do these uh, prevention programs, do they uh, work better with uh, girls than boys? And the other question mm -hmm. is, uh, no one has mentioned about ACL fractures, which is also a very common in, in pediatric population, uh, do these uh, tend to follow the same as ACL injuries, the same pattern? So I'll take this. I'll take the first half of that. From an injury prevention perspective, many of the programs have shown, uh, although the incidence rate tends to be higher in the female population, particularly in the 14 to 17 year old range, uh, we have shown equal efficacy or very sort of statistically similar efficacy in the male and female cohorts um, to the uh, the applications that I've known that have been done uh, conducted in both genders. The PEP program was only analyzed within the female population, but the 11 plus we analyzed in both and they were similar with efficacy rates. So yes, I'll take the surgical. So can I just conclude sure. on that? <laughs> both, <laughs> both sexes yeah. should do injury of prevention Of course, programs. absolutely. Mm. I'd like to uh, talk about your uh, second question. Very good, relevant question about the ACL uh, fractures or tibial spine fractures. Uh, in our study, these patients who had this injury were excluded. Uh, out of 52 eligible patients, two had the tibial spine fracture, uh, but they were not in our study. Um, uh, we have discussed previously in the ACL registry um, because now we have started to also include non-operated patients and that's very important to know more about the ACL injured skeletal <coughs> mature patients. Uh, and then we discussed should we also include the fractures um, and the decision was in the, um, in the group that we, we should, should not exclude these patients because it's a different injury uh, and probably a different outcome. They, yeah, I did a, a smaller follow-up study previously from our hospital 
uh, of, uh, of this group. And I think it was about um, uh, between uh, 26 or uh, 28 patients who had this injury uh, and they were all uh, operated. And we had a big problem with um, sort of, it, it was a, they had a slow rehab, but when they were through rehab, they, they uh, worked really well and had, uh, if you did the Lachman test on them, they, would, they were looser, uh, more slack than what is uh, uh, compared to the other knee. Um, but they didn't have instability problems. And similar, similar findings I've seen in other studies on, uh, on tibial spine fractures. So what um, the conclusion in that, in that work, even though that was a, a very small project, was that it's very important to, to try to get them mobilized as early as possible because of the, um, previously they had often had cast uh, for several weeks after the operation. Thank you all and congratulations on a really lovely discussion of lots of challenges that we see managing this young population. I've had the privilege to um, get to know and work with, with all of you actually <laughs> and one of the things that I've noticed is you manage patients in a different way. You, you don't do the silo approach where the physio's over here and the surgeon's over here. Could you perhaps share a little bit about how you bring the different disciplines together and how you how we work as a team. Uh, I think we have um, we have a very we have a lot of uh, tone contact in between us and we have when we get patients um, sent to us we we uh, share them <laughs> when we discuss sometimes before the patients are coming, sometimes after the patient has been, uh, has been to one of us. And we also have um, uh, a very good network. And I saw that several of you are here. So we have, we have um, a network of, of other physiotherapists and doctors that send patients to us when they have uh, pediatric ACL injuries because they're not that common uh, in sort of for for most people, they're still not as common as uh, the injuries in the um, grown-ups. Yes, and I will say that uh, regardless of the injury, it really helps if you know mm -hmm. an orthopedic surgeon, if you're a physio, and if you have their phone numbers and they like it when you call, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the usual approach is to write up a report and then send, and it's not always that that report makes it. It depends mm -hmm. on the system you're in. Uh, so knowing the surgeon and attending a surgical conference, get to know them, that's a really good uh, thing to do. Thank you, um, Suzanne Gard from uh, Switzerland. Um, how do you assess the readiness to go back to sport in children? <laughs> like the mental state of mind or is it different? Uh, so even though thank you uh, for you three nice presentations. Uh, um, here I am. Believe that uh, my question goes to you, Erasmus, uh, regarding uh, your term uh, structure specific load. Are you talking about tissue specific load? So why don't why don't you use that term tissue instead of structure? They feel that they can trust you with their concerns. And I would say that uh, often uh, it's important be, to be, Because being a clinician uh, and a scientist, then you, you're dealing with tissue and tissue load. And it's different for yeah, the totally skin agree. compared and to the uh, muscles, compared to so the tendon. My way of doing it is also compared that to the I, uh, it's very important joint. that we follow them uh, several so times. And I would suggest that, 
to change yeah, this to tissue I get specific. Is someone I haven't seen and they come in and I'm going to do a return to sports assessment. That's almost not possible. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so if I follow them over time, then sorry, it will gradually build up and we can see that they are ready. But at the time so we do the decision, I do the singular hot tests and the more standardized procedures. But what I do with the youngest ones is that I create a, an obstacle course uh, within the clinic and I have them jump around, give them, give them different kinds of challenges. And then I sort of watch them and see what the quality of it. Do they dare to jump down from something high? Are they landing on both legs? And just giving them lots of things without telling them what I'm really looking for. And that, I feel, gives me the best sort of feeling of if they're ready or not. Maybe that's not appropriate in English. So as non-native speakers, you also have problems. But I fully agree. I liked your uh, focus on the problems that can help us to solutions, uh, finding solutions for a future. So I think that's 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 really uh, very nice and, and, and very challenging. But I, I will acknowledge that the work you do to to raise the bar. We don't really know uh, about this. We have. Uh, we have in our study, which is it's a very Thank you for study. three very nice presentations. Um, uh, I have a question on training some, load some to whoever two of the feels best suited to answer. Seem to have a Let's say uh, uh, we build training load schemes. Uh, is there a risk like that we will build schemes uh, that put every athlete into a, a box? Because in like the end, the best athletes like in almost every sport are the athletes who, who do extras uh, all the time. They train extra, they like work extra um, hard, etc. Do you think there's a risk like that attached? all these technical so solutions and training load schemes uh, could, could uh, inhibit uh, performance in the future? We, we do not know. <laughs> and also, these two patients, they don't have a lot of instability. So, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I would like to thank all the speakers and the amazing audience <laughs> and conclude the session. Thank you.